we need to spend a little bit more time thinking about what the structure of the atom is. And so I'm going to take us on a short trip through history just to kind of find a chronology for how we understand the atom. Now we've talked about a couple of these experiments before in our earlier conversation about atoms, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth. And this time we're also going to focus on light or electromagnetic radiation and how it interacts with matter and use that as a way to understand how we've under, you know, how we figured out what atoms are like. So atoms were first coined as a term here back in about 400 BC by the Greek philosopher Democritus. And I'm only mentioning this because it is a concept from that time that just meant some unit of indivisible matter. And so the term got recycled, you know, however many years later, um, when people were actually exploring the atomic structure of nature in a more quantitative way. So we're going to fast forward a long way to Antoine Lavoisier, who we've talked about a little bit. And the reason why he comes in here is that besides for being one of the one of the founders of modern chemistry, uh, he coined the term element. And of course, he also did a bunch of experiments in identifying them and separating them using physical and chemical methods and pioneering the scientific process. So this is 1777. And uh, fast forward a few more years, 1803, you have John Dalton, who we've heard of. And Dalton was recycling now this term atom and talking about them as tiny particles and he was the one of course who has been studying gases remember Dalton's law and so most of his conclusions had to do with the behavior of gases so he proposed that atoms of each element were all different from each other's and one of their differences was their masses so 60 plus years later you have Dmitry Mendeleev, who takes the, the research done by Dalton and quite a few others and creates the first periodic table. So the first periodic table was organizing these elements that, I'll put Antoine over here because I was feeling bad I hadn't put his first name in there, that Antoine Lavoisier had uh, sort of been talking about. And of course, some of these elements had been known since antiquity. And the periodic table organized the elements based on their properties. And scientists had studied the properties of elements using different chemical reactions. So they looked at how they reacted under similar uh, properties. Here we go. How they reacted under similar circumstances. So what does this do when we put it into water? What does this other thing do when we put it into water? What does this thing do when we put it into flame? What does it do when we put it into oxygen? Um, you know, so there's lots of different things that um, you can study by chemical reactions. So it didn't take too much longer, and this one should be familiar as well. We had J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron. Of course, he didn't call it an electron at that point. He called it a cathode ray. But that's what it was. And he figured out that it was negatively charged and uh, eventually figured out that it was a subatomic particle. So J.J. Thompson actually did propose at this point a model of an atom here where he thought that the positive and the negative charges in the atom were kind of equally spread around. I guess I better make the same number of positives and negatives. And this was called, or by him anyway, he, he described it that the electrons in this atom model were spread around like raisins in a plum pudding. And of course, none of us have a, a plum pudding in the way that he meant. It's sort of a dense cake that has raisins throughout it. So you might think of it as more like a chocolate chip cookie, which is a little bit more of a familiar analogy uh, to those of us in the United States. And so we are also already talked about 
the response to this, which was Ernest Rutherford. And Rutherford, both J.J. Thompson and Rutherford were uh, researchers at the University of Cambridge in England, and so they were colleagues of each other. And Ernest Rutherford thought, well, I don't know, I mean, I really need to test this hypothesis uh, because I can't just let somebody's you know, proposal stand. And so in 1909, he tested this, and you remember that we talked about the gold foil experiment. And he discovered that atoms are mostly empty space. That rather than this chocolate chip cookie model, instead you had some kind of small and heavy nucleus where most of the math mass was that had all the positive charge in it, and then you had some kind of negative electrons outside somewhere, but he wasn't really sure on where that would be. And uh, Rutherford described this experience of doing the gold foil experiment where he shot these alpha particles at gold foil. So here's our gold foil, and these alpha particles. And remember that an alpha particle is a helium nucleus, And so it's a pretty bitty little particle, but it's much bigger than an electron. And Rutherford said that when he saw these, uh, these alpha particles being deflected by this gold foil, he said, it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me. It was almost as incredible as if you had fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you, which is maybe a little bit of an exaggeration because gold foil is a bit more substantial than tissue paper and alpha particles are much smaller than a 15 inch shell but still this idea that this alpha particle would get deflected by gold foil was a pretty pretty incredible kind of thing so this was a really important uh, step that we've already talked about in terms of our general understanding of the structure but what came from it was shortly thereafter Niels Bohr in 1913 also had a model of the atom. And this, of course, we call the Bohr model. And the Bohr model, we actually need to take a step back here and pause and talk about some of the experiments that were going on that led to the Bohr model in addition to what J.J. Thompson and Rutherford had been doing. So let's take a little side trip actually back into time and take a look at another set of experiments. Back in 1885, Johann Balmer was doing some experiments by exciting gases. Let's go and take a look at what these look like. Hey there. So I'm going to show you um, an example of what a Balmer tube looked like. So remember we were talking about uh, Johann Balmer and he was exploring uh, exciting gases. And he was probably putting some of them in flame, um, but he also could potentially have made something kind of like J.J. Thompson's cathode ray tube, which is what we're looking at right here. So this has no wires that connect it. There are electrodes on both ends. It's a little bit corroded over here, so it's a bit hard to see. But if you can get close enough to it, you can see there's no actual wires in here. In between these electrodes, it's just a container that has been evacuated uh, and then has some gas. In this particular case, we have hydrogen gas. So I have a uh, device here that will run electricity through the gas so we can take a look at what Balmer was seeing when he was exciting each of the gases. So as we said before, each gas has its own uh, characteristic lines, its characteristic color, 
Um, sometimes the colors are a little bit close to each other, but once we actually look at which wavelengths are being are visible, each one has a different one like a fingerprint. So I'm going to turn off the lights and then we'll go ahead and turn it on. Sorry, it kind of vibrates. So you can see what this color is like, but what we're going to do is also try and see it through the diffraction grating. So I've got a little device here that's going to split the light up, so kind of like a prism, so we can see what different colors are here. So we're going to see whether this works. Okay, so what I want you to look at is the bands of color that are bright because we're getting a little backwash from my computer screen. So you can see there's a red line, there's kind of a turquoise one, and there's a purplish one. And those are all the specific wavelengths of light that are coming from the hydrogen. The other tool I was using to split the light was this. It's called a handheld spectroscope and you look through the eyepiece, you point the little slit at your light source and then over here we have a little grating where light can pass through and it actually has a wavelength scale on it. Um, I think it's in, well I can't actually remember, but anyway it's the visible wavelength scale because that's what our eyes are used to detecting. and so. You can see which colors are present and you can see what their wavelengths are. So if you're in class, we'll play around with these and you can take a look at a couple of different uh, wavelength lines. We might actually do this in lab too, so I should probably check so I don't steal their thunder. Anyhow, it's fun to do more than once. So this splitting of the light was what Joseph Balmer was seeing, Johann Balmer, sorry. What Balmer was seeing when he identified the fingerprint region for each light, or excuse me, each gas that uh, he had detected. So he noticed that each gas had a little bit of a different arrangement of lines. Now what he discovered was that with hydrogen, he could come up with an equation for figuring out what the position of those lines were, so what the wavelength was based on two integers that he squared in the denominator. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that equation was now. All right, so Balmer's uh, equation that he came up with was the wavelength, one over the wavelength in nanometers is equal to R times one over N1 squared minus one over N2 squared. And R was a weird constant, which was 1.097 times 10 to the minus 2, 1 over nanometers. And N1 and N2 are integers, they're whole numbers, positive whole numbers. And also N2 has to be bigger than N1. Okay, so if you have those hydrogen lines, remember we had a red one, sorry it's not H2, we had a turquoise one, and we had a purple one, and those are the ones that we were able to see pretty easily. Now what we couldn't really see uh, because this was um, you know through my cell phone camera was what the wavelengths were. So the red wavelength is actually 656 nanometers. The turquoise one is 486 nanometers. And there's actually two purple ones. So we have 434 nanometers and then 410 nanometers. And because those are pretty close together, we couldn't distinguish between the two of them through the cell phone. So anyway, there's four visible lines. And you can figure out an N1 and an N2, if you, uh, if you try, and it turns out that our N1 is equal to 2 for all of these 
different wavelengths. So let's take a second and figure out what N2 would be for this one. So we would have 1 over, we'll just try it for the red one, 1 over 656 nanometers is equal to 1.097 times 10 to the minus 2 1 over nanometer times 1 over 4 minus 1 over n2 squared. Okay, so don't freak out. These are just numbers. So if we simplify this a little bit, all right, if we take 1 over 656, we get 1.52 times 10 to the minus 3. The units are 1 over nanometers. So we can divide out this number, 1.097 times 10 to the minus 2, 1 over nanometers. And the units will cancel out and we'll get 0.1386, I think, is what I get. So that's over on the left hand side now because we divided out this number and on the right hand side we still have 1 over 4 minus 1 over n2 squared. So 1 over 4 is just 0.25 so we can subtract that from both sides. So this will leave us with negative 0.111 is equal to 1 over negative 1 over 1 over n squared. So let's get rid of that negative sign and now this is just a process of algebra. We've got n2, we're going to bring it over here, we're going to have 1 over 0.111 on the right hand side now in the denominator. So this is equal to 9, which means that n2, which has to be a whole number, is going to be 3. So if we don't get it exactly 9 right here, don't worry about it, just round to the nearest whole number, because I didn't keep all the decimal places. So this is telling us we have some kind of weird integer relationship that randomly happens to work with light from the hydrogen. So random, right? Somehow we have n2 is equal to 3, n1 is equal to 2. And this works for the other integers as well. That this one, the turquoise one, turns out to have an n2 is equal to 4. The purple one, the first one has an n2 is equal to 5, and this other one, uh, excuse me, these all need to be n2s. Sorry about that. This one has an n2 is equal to 6. Balmer had no idea why this worked, like zero. So remember we were talking about John, uh, Niels Bohr a minute ago? more than a minute now. But Niels Bohr said, well, what if what's happening in these atoms is that you have your nucleus and then you have like little orbits. So I've got an n equals 1 orbit. I've got an n equals 2 orbit. I've got an n equals 3 orbit. Sorry, I'm not making a very good circle here. It's supposed to be a concentric circle. Here's an n equals 3 orbit. And so he said, what if the wavelength, this red wavelength, happens because my electron gets excited up to this n equals 3 level, and then it drops down to this n equals 2 level, and it gives off some light that's red. So Bohr came up with this model for the atom where the electrons were orbiting the nucleus. And they had these little shelves that they could be in that he labeled with these n values that matched up with the uh, Balmer equation here that we just looked at. This little guy right here. And this sounded really pretty cool there was only one problem. He could only accurately predict the wavelengths with hydrogen. His equation, his model, only worked for hydrogen and not for any other elements. So that was a sad story for Niels Bohr, but he actually made a 
I mean, this was a really important sidestep for what the atomic structure looked like. So even though he didn't totally figure it out, um, Bohr made huge contributions to our understanding of atoms. So, you know, don't think I'm ragging on Bohr. I'm not. He was amazing. Max Planck, oh, excuse me. Niels Bohr had an additional piece of information that we needed to know about light. So previously we were talking about light as a wave. And this was the understanding that Balmer had when he was working on his model. Bohr had a little bit more information and he was also relying on the work of another scientist, Max Planck, who was working on black body radiation, which we're probably not really going to talk about here much. But you can look him up. And what Max Planck figured out was that light doesn't just act like a wave. Light also acts like a particle. And the reason why this was important was because of the energies. Notice that Bohr had these little chunks of energy that were being given off based on the distance between these n equals 3 and n equals 2, for example, little orbits. And Max Planck was the first person to kind of give uh, some credence to this kind of an idea. He published his work around 1900 that you needed to calculate the energy of light rather than looking at the amplitude, which is what you do for a wave, like a physical wave, you need to do it from the frequency or from the wavelengths. So this was the equation of energy that Max Planck came up with. And H is just a uh, proportionality constant that we now call Planck's constant. And it's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. You don't have to memorize this number at all. Anyway, so uh, so Bohr knew that light was quantized, is our fancy word. That it comes in chunks that we call photons. And so you can have a single packet of energy, like the one given off when Niels Bohr's uh, electron dropped from this n equals 3 orbit to the n equals 2 orbit. And so this worked okay with Max Planck's quantization of energy. It was further evidence that we had quantization of light. Now, there's more than I can tell in this one video. It's going to become ridiculously long. So I'm going to wrap this up now. But what I want you to do is actually calculate, practice calculating the energy of the light. So let's take some wavelengths or some frequencies and try calculating it. So let's say that we take first some visible light with a wavelength of 625 nanometers, so that's probably red, and we're going to calculate the energy for that. And then we'll also calculate it for a cell phone with frequency of 1700 megahertz. So you're going to set up this equation just in our normal way. So for one we have 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. That's Planck's constant. Then since we have the wavelength we're going to use this version of the equation. So we also need the speed of light, that's C. And then we're going to divide by the wavelength. So I'm going to be lazy and just write 625 times 10 to the 9, minus 9 meters so that my units cancel out. So when I calculate that, I'm going to get 3.18 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So this is a pretty small amount of energy, but this is for one photon of red light with the wavelength 625 nanometers. So if we're using frequency instead, 
we don't need to use the wavelength and we don't need to use the speed of light because of course I hope that you noticed that this just comes the substitution that I just did here is from our original equation for the relationship between the wavelength and the frequency of light so this isn't a new equation here so there's my Planck's constant then my frequency 1700 remember that mega is 10 to the 6 so we'll go times 10 to the 6th 1 over seconds and when we solve for that energy we get 1.13 times 10 to the minus 24 joules so this is a radio frequency and so it has less energy than visible light so we're going to finish up with this video here but we'll continue on with the other discoveries that led to our modern understanding of the atom in the next video